Hello, my name is Glenn Nelson. I work for the Bioimaging Unit at Newcastle University. And this lecture today is to look at image processing and analysis using Fiji. So you have a microscope image and what do you want to do with it? The most common downstream manipulations are conversion for publication or presentation and analysis of the image contents. Analysis of images is semi-quantitative, um, just, just because of the way that the cameras work and the way that we collect the data, it's at best semi-quantitative. But if it's done carefully, it does allow a statistical comparison between the treatments that you've performed for either your controls and your treated or in between treatments. So first of all, what is a microscope image? Well, firstly, uh, is it either a colour or monochrome camera? Um, colour cameras uh, are like what you have on your phone. It um, has a, a mask in front of the chip. And the mask allows only red, green or blue light through to a pixel underneath. And that reports as one pixel from the camera and gives you a, a value for red, green and blue RGB. This is good for transmitted image images. So for example, a bright field image or from H&E staining. These work fine, but this mask itself actually blocks an awful lot of the light from reaching the sensor. So for more sensitive applications, it gets in the way. On top of that, if you wanted to look at something in the UV or in the far red, then this mask would block all of that light getting to the chip. So therefore, these sorts of cameras are no use if you want to use those sort of parts of the spectrum. So a lot of our microscopy is performed with monochrome cameras. And a monochrome camera is a as a, as, a, as a chip, but it has no mask in front. So every value just gets one, every pixel just gets one value. Um, and this is just light. It doesn't know what the light is and it doesn't know what color it is. Uh, we can tell the software which color of light we're looking at, and we can then pseudo color the actual acquisition so that it looks like what you would see down the oculars. When we do this sort of work with fluorescence microscopy, we're often capturing more than one colour. So we'll have different channels of, of light and we'll capture these as multiple leaves within, within a single image. On top of this, there's differences in bit depth. So this is very much dependent on the camera or the detector on the microscope. And it depends on its sensitivity as to how many electrons it can capture before it's full. This affects the dynamic range of what you can possibly capture on, 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 the, on the detector or the camera. Things like um, a, a phone camera uh, with, that has an RGB image will give you eight bits per channel. So it'll give you three eight-bit images, or three eight-bit values for each pixel. But often we have uh, pixels that are larger than this. And so they'll allow to give us 12 or 16 bits per pixel is quite frequent. This increases the range of possible values you can get. So a bit is just a, a zero or one in computer terms. And if you have eight of those in, in a row, then you can have the possibility of 256 different gray levels that reported for each pixel. If you've got 12, it's a 4,096. So if it's 16, you've got 65,536 possible values. So you can see it dramatically increases the possible dynamic rate, the possible range of values we can get. And we try to match this to the dynamic range of the of the wells of the of the camera of the camera detector. The colour cameras themselves are uh, often for us uh, are larger than eight bits per, per colour. So some of them are 12 or 14 bits per colour. And you may have come across this as well if you use digital SLRs, for example, and shooting raw raw formats on those. They're often 14 bits per colour, and then you scale them down by converting from the raw, uh, raw channel. And again, it's to give you that extra dynamic range. So this is what our uh, systems are like. In terms of uh, present, presenting your images or publication of images, it, you should be aware of what the current guidelines are from, uh, for example, nature. Um, Images submitted with a manuscript for review should be minimally processed, for instance, to add arrows to a micrograph. Authors should retain their unprocessed data and metadata files, as editors may request them to aid in a manuscript evaluation. This is important. You need to make sure that you 
do all of your analysis on your raw data if possible, and any processing is done on a copy of that raw data and you keep the raw data. However, minimal processing, such as adding an arrow to a micrograph, is very unusual that you could get away with so little uh, manipulation. And Nature go on to acknowledge that a certain degree of image processing is acceptable for publication and for some experiments and techniques is unavoidable. But the final image must correctly represent the original data and conform to community standards. You should also note that you should list all image acquisition tools and image processing software packages used and you should document key image gathering settings and processing manipulations in the methods. So when writing your methods sections, you should make sure you know exactly what you've done and what you've used and, and, and detail it accordingly. Obviously, Nature realised that we capture images that are high bit depth than what can be used for making a publication. And so therefore, these, uh, these acknowledgements of image processing is, is, is ad addressing that. There are other requirements for publication and to a certain degree for presentations. Uh, published images usually want to be at least 300 dots per inch or pixels per inch. Um, it's usually better to try and aim for 600 dots per inch as a minimum for printouts. They also need to be in a printer friendly format. This means that every image that you put into a presentation or into a figure uh, needs to be a, a, an RGB image. So it needs to be converted to a color image with three channels, each in eight bit, one for red, one for green and one for blue. This is a slight problem for us because for our fluorescence imaging, most of them are, aren't measured in dots per inch, they're measured in micrometers per pixel. This isn't a problem, you just have to remember to think of, the, think of the conversion factors when you're upscaling or downscaling. So if you consider each pixel as one three hundredth of an inch, then a 512 by 512 pixel image will be, only give you something that's 1.7 inches, about 4.3 centimetres square, if you were to print, if you print it out at 300 dpi. Usually, your images are single channels of one colour and at a higher bit depth. So for example, you might have a DAPI image and an AlexaFlow 594 image taken with a flash four camera, which is 16 bits. It now has two leaves, two, two images in this one image. One is pseudocolored blue and one's red, and they're both 16 bit. That would need converting into an RGB image in eight bit, in which you would have the red for the Alexafluor 594 and blue for the DAPI, an, an empty green channel, but you still need to have that as an RGB image. There is also further pre-processing that may be required, such as if you have a Z-stack, you might require to flatten it or render it. In terms of scaling, it is best to ensure that your images are captured at a high enough pixel density to avoid upscaling. Any upscaling is going to introduce potential artifacts into the image. If it is necessary, you must state this in the methods and it should be applied equally to all of the images that you're showing. For RGB conversion, ideally a direct conversion is the minimal processing. And this still requires merging. In, our, in this example, we've just had the two channels or, or possibly three channels. In practice though, especially for our fluorescence images, the histogram is often heavily skewed to the lower end and we don't actually utilize the full dynamic range of the camera to avoid photo bleaching on the sample. And so therefore, adjustment of the lookup table via the brightness and contrast is unavoidable. If this is necessary, it's simply stated in the methods and you make sure you apply it equally to all of the images that you're trying to compare between. So the software that we're going to talk about today and I'm going to briefly introduce you to is Fiji, but there are other pieces of software that you should also be aware of. Um, ImageJ and Fiji themselves are both uh, supported on any operating system, uh, free, support multi-channel images and higher bit depths and work with microscope raw formats. We have some paid software, paid for software that is licensed within the bioimaging unit and these can be used um, and for some, some things such as 3D rendering that can often be better. So Velocity, Maris and Huygens are all paid for pieces of software and we do have licenses for these within the bioimaging unit but a limited number. And as you can see, they all 
you know, we'll do what, what we want to do with uh, our microscope images. Another one of note is IC, which works works with ImageJ or Fiji as well, um, and is platform independent and is really nice if you were to, to do some, some complicated scripting and trying to automate your image, image workflows. At the bottom here I've li listed common for, um, um, photo manipulation tools, Photoshop, GIMP and Paint. Uh, Paint is not worth considering, it's absolutely appalling. Uh, it's very minimal in what you can do with it. GIMP is essentially a free version of Photoshop, is, is a way of thinking of it. Uh, it's a, a free uh, platform independent tool. But for both of these multi-channel images, they don't have great support. And they do have support for 8-bit, for greater than 8-bit depth, but it's not ideal. And they don't support raw microscope formats. They're useful for creating a whole figure, but for actual processing of the image, the microscope images are not ideal. Lastly, the manufacturers free viewers. Uh, these are downloadable from their websites. So for example, Zeiss have uh, Zen Light and Leica have uh, Las X Light. Um, and you, you, can, you can get these for yourself if you're running on a, a Microsoft operating system. Uh, they don't work in other operating systems. And yes, they are completely compatible, especially with the, that particular manufacturer's uh, file types, but they're very limited in what you can actually do with the data. Often you can render the data or create uh, an RGB image to, to export, for example, but for analysis point of view, for the free viewers, it literally is just a viewer rather than analysis. ImageJ and Fiji are both at the top of that list. ImageJ and Fiji are essentially the same thing. In fact, Fiji stands for Fiji is just ImageJ. ImageJ is a simple shell and it's for image manipulation and it can be extended with plugins. There are many plugins available online or you can write your own. The beauty of Fiji is it comes with a large number of these already installed. And the most important one from our point of view is one called Bioformats. This is the plugin that allows you to open Microscope raw data files. Image and Fiji are both free to download and can be added to any desktop, including campus managed machines at the uni. You can ask the IT department to install them for you, or if you want, you can just actually extract them to a, a local drive where you have read write access, which is CTEMP. Uh, and in, in that folder, it will run because it doesn't actually need to write to the registry. This link here will take you to the Fiji website where you can download and a platform platform dependent version of, of, of Fiji and it has full installed instructions. It's reasonably easy to follow. In terms of finding commands and help in Fiji, when you start it, you just get this small window and uh, with, it, with a list of file menus above. We have a, a simple search bar where in which you can type uh, the, the things you want to search for. So for example, if I started typing duplicate, uh, it will come up with a possible list of commands and I can choose which one is uh, suitable for what I want you to do. Uh, and then either click run or I can uh, follow the path to where it is. So for example, duplicate is under uh, image duplicate. On top of this, there is also a help button and this will take you to online help for these for each of these commands. And further, more detailed help is available from the community. There is the ImageJ mailing list that's available here, or the image.sc forum, where there's multiple uh, pieces of uh, analysis software and acquisition software involved in here, but they do have a sub forum that is purely for Fiji. Lastly, there are also many videos on YouTube. And at the end of this, uh, presentation that there is a supplementary uh, a couple of pages that have some links for these uh, for, for you to look at. Opening images with the image J or Fiji is straightforward. You can literally simply drag the image onto the bottom info bar, this part of the, this part of the uh, Fiji window. Or you can drag the image onto the Fiji icon or you can use the file open command and or, or the file import bioformats command. Um, file open will open native image file formats but will and will also open text files 
image gen macro files, Java files, region of interest files that you've saved, lookup table files or data files. When you open options, open, open your images, the bioformats importer gives you lots of options, asking if you want to open them as individual channels or as stacks with channels or as volume and or as volume and or time. My general preference is to open as a hyper stack, and so it will actually have all of the leaves from either channels and or Z and or time all laid on top of one another, and you can use the sliders to move, move, move through this, move through your image. When you have open an image as a hyperstack, for example, uh, it will look something like this. And here we've got some different pieces of information. At the top of the image is the file name. This tells us what the file was called when it was saved. And below that in the, is an info bar above the image. On the left, it tells you the image channels and stack size. So here it says uh, three out of three channels, and we're on channel three of three. Is what, is where we're, what we're currently looking at. On the right, it tells us the scale and bit depth and image size. So the numbers in parentheses are the actual number of pixels in X and Y. The scaling is stored correctly, uh, so it knows that this image is 101 by 101 microns. Each channel is eight bits de deep, so there's a, a value of 0 to 255 for every single pixel in the image, and the whole file is itself three megabytes. We can choose how we show this data. Um, and at the moment, these are, are I've opened the tools for uh, brightness and contrast adjustment and for channels. These can be found at the menu image color channels tool, image adjust brightness contrast. The channels tool allows us to select whether or not we look at one channel at a time or look at it as a composite. Here I have a composite switched on and channel one, two, and three switched on. Channel three is red, that's why it's shown red here. And I'd, so I'm currently selected, as you can see by the slider at the bottom. And the brightness and contrast tool is showing me the histogram for the red channel at the moment. As I mentioned before, we often are using uh, quite dim signals. So we're down near the lower end of the histogram. And you can see that on here, it looks quite dim. And most, of, most of the data is down in the lower part. We can adjust this either by moving these sliders for minimum and maximum or brightness and contrast. Uh, don't try and do both, you'll confuse yourself. Um, or use the auto, which will try and find the min, min and max to set the, this, the, the, the dynamic range that you're looking at for, for this intensity scale. You can alter the pseudo coloring on each channel if desired. So for example, these, each color is just a lookup table or LUT, and you can change the colors. And the easiest way is with the channels tool and click more at the bottom and select color. It has some common options at the bottom, or you can actually edit the LUT or, or, or create it and create your own um, to, to, to change the color for that particular channel. You can continue doing this for each channel, either using the channel select radios, these buttons here, or by moving the channel slider at the bottom. In this particular example here, we have both the channel slider and the Z slider. So it's currently on the first channel and about halfway through the Z stack. Once you have an image uh, with the correct, with your desired lookup tables for each of the channels, you can then quite simply make an RGB image. Using the menu image type RGB color, we'll create a copy of the currently displayed channels with the currently selected lookup tables and the brightness and contrast settings that you set. So you will end up with an RGB that looks like you you set it with the different, different colors and brightness and contrast settings. Now the cells you at the top, it's kept the scaling so it knows what size the image is, but it's lost all information about the data depth. It's now just an RGB. So it's just eight bits per pixel in red, green, and blue. If you had a lookup table in here that was a, a composite lookup table, such as yellow, then it'll have to add equal values to the red and green channels so to, oh, to show this as yellow in this, this image. So what you have to remember now is that this is no longer a raw data file of your actual image. 
and the analysis on this will not give you the same results as analysis on your raw data. You can convert these back to a comp RGB composite, so it will split the red, green, and blue channels for you. But remember that the data has already been converted to possibly already down to eight bits rather than higher. And also it's remembered if you've used a skewed brightness and contrast, so if you have altered the minimum and maxima, it's going to affect what this looks like and the data itself will be different to what you started with. So yes, note the merge RGB format. And remember, this is no longer a, a true copy of the original. It's just a representation of what the data looked like. It's converted into a format that's acceptable for printing and PDFs and presentations, etc. But it's not actually the same as the raw data that you started with. There are other options for RGB image formation. For example, you can make, make split the channels into a montage. The easiest way to do this from an RGB is to make it into a composite image. So use the menu image color make composite. And then you can convert this as a stack using image stacks make montage because it will have made this composite as an RGB stack. And you'll get, get an image that looks something like this where you have the two channels split one, one next to each other. Another common tool that was required and should be used for presenting all of your microscopy data is adding a scale bar to the image. It should have read in the correct scale of the image at the start from bioformats. And using the menu analyze tools scale bar, you can add a scale bar. It will ask you which of the four corners you want to put this in, or if you've drawn a region of interest with a line tool or even an ROI a region of interest tool, you can place the scale bar where you've drawn the region of interest. It will ask you if you want to have this burned in or as an overlay. If it's onto your RGB image, then obviously burning in is, is, is fine. It's not going to do any harm. You can add it, ask it to add the, the, the text as well for the actual scaling. But you can notice here that that's actually a little bit blurry. The anti-ionizing is not great in Fiji. And you may be better using the downstream software such as uh, Photoshop or Illustrator or GIMP or, or even uh, Microsoft PowerPoint to actually put this in the zone. Alternatively, you, if you draw the scale bar, you can leave all text off and just write it in the figure legend that the scale bar equals X microns. To go back to how you should process and manipulate data for presentations, we have some, here are some further guidelines from nature. Images gathered at different times from different locations should not be combined into a single image unless it is stated the resultant image is a product, so for example, of time average data or time lapse sequence. If juxtaposing is essential, borders should be clearly demarcated in the figure and described in the legend. Touch up tools such as cloning and healing tools should not be used. Uh, this is deliberately obscuring manip and manipulating the data and is frowned upon. Processing such as changing brightness and contrast is appropriate, but only when it's applied equally across the entire image. And it should also be applied equally to the controls. Contrast should not be adjusted so the data disappear. Excessive manipulations, such as to emphasize one region at the expense of others, is inappropriate. And, it's, uh, and as is emphasizing experimental data relative to the control. In other words, treat everything the same so that your brightness and contrast adjustments are all done on the same for your controls on your treated samples. And it's always remember, you need to keep your original unprocessed images. It's possible that you could be asked for them. So in terms of image analysis with Fiji, Frequently, you only want to analyze one of the channels or maybe multiple channels with different parameters. But often there's an extra channel there just as a counter stain. For example, DAPI is used as a nuclear counter stain. You also may wish to automate the tasks to avoid bias or increase throughput or both. There are a few ways of, of avoiding bias. Um, one way would be to capture um, random, random fields for, for your, from the imaging. Or if you've got if, uh, 
a, a directory of images, you can use random analysis. For example, you can use a grid overlay. Uh, so the menu analyze tools grid gives you an option for how densely you want, densely you want to lay the grid and whether you have a random offset. And then you can analyze each of the cells that's at an interstice, in, in, interstice of, of, the, of this grid. Uh, so in this example here, I would analyze uh, this cell and this cell, and I wouldn't analyze this one, this one, and this one. Obviously, using these sort of random analysis methods minimum, it decreases the number of cells you can analyze from each image, but it does give you a, a better random, randomizing method if, if you're worried about bias. So other, other examples of image analysis, counting of cell numbers or spots or vesicles, for example. Uh, this just requires a binary yes, no for each object. And it can be done with a simple binary conversion of the image data. The quality and accuracy of this will depend on how good the signal to noise ratio is of the actual raw image. You may find that it requires a mask to identify the nuclei or cells before you actually do the counting. The other alternative is uh, actually looking at the values of the pixels and so looking at the fluorescence intensity within individual channels. As I mentioned before, to do this in, a, in a, as quantifiable manner as possible, you, have, you must make sure that the settings of the microscope parameters were actually kept the same between all of your samples so that your know, controls and your treatments were all being captured in exactly the same way to allow comparison. It is still only semi-quantitative. Um, we have a loss, a, a loss of light throughout the entire imaging process, uh, even when it comes down to the detector. The amount of fluorescence that you actually get from each fluorophore is variable, um, and uh, as is the a capture of the data, depending on how well the photons are detected. The most accurate method we have is with uh, avalanche photodiode type detectors, and you can actually do photon counting although there still is a quantum efficiency uh, drop off with, with the actual detector, it doesn't see all photons, but it is about the most quantifiable met method that we have. Um, some of our confocals are equipped with these and it can, can be used. As I've stated several times, you must use the raw data files for actually measuring the fluorescence intensity, not converted ones. And in the same as with the cell counting or, or, spot, or spot counting, you may require to make a mask to identify individual cells or nuclei before the counts. So in terms of counting, you can identify and segment the objects. And with good quality images, simple thresholding to separate them from the back signal from the background often works. A typical analysis procedure for this will provide either total counts on a per, per field basis, or it'll give you a region of interest or an ROI that is, uh, or the object is uh, object founds area. If you do want intensities from some of the channels within these regions of interest, then the final analysis needs to be performed on the original data, even if you drew the region of interest on, on, a, on a masked segmented object. Counting can be done completely manually, and there is a simple cell counter in, included in Fiji that allows you to do this. Uh, so in the menu plugins, analyze cell counter, cell counter, that brings up this window where you click initialize on the image that you want to count. And then you start using each counter for different things. So if I wanted to count green spots, I could put them in type one. If I want to count red spots, I could put them in type two. And you just keep clicking on them on the image and it adds them up for you. This data can be exported as the results uh, and, and also you can save the markers if you want to keep track of what you've counted and what you haven't counted for, for going coming back to in the future. However, this is manual and slow. Uh, there is uh, alter alternative methods for some rather simple spot counting that can work on the raw data and doesn't require any, any masks being created. Uh, a method called find maxima, which is found under the menu process, find maxima. This will look at the local area around the, the, all of the pixels to find spikes, and bright spots against the local background. So things like this, for example, might be seen against the local background. You have to tell it how prominent, so how, how, how big these should be. So essentially uh, how, how high the spike is above, above the background of, of the local background that you're looking at. 
You can do this when you open the Find Maxima option. There's a preview which you can switch on. And then the prominence is the part that you need to adjust so that you're seeing this, the, these, these bright spots against the darker background. And using preview, you can ascertain whether or not it's finding the spots as you expect it to. Once you've got this value set, you keep it the same for all of your images if, to, do, to perform your analysis. In terms of the output type, you can tell it to give you a count or a list. Um, a simple count, for example, will then tell you for this image, it tells me the image name and then the count that it's got from channel two of three. And it says I have 92 spots in channel two. So if I wanted this on a per nucleus basis, I could just count, simply count the number of nuclei and divide that number to get an average per, per field, for example. Alternatively, I could have added, added this into a more complex routine where I find the nuclei as a region of interest first, then count the spots inside each nucleus one at a time. If we do need to make it into a binary image to, to give us uh, something that we can identify the particles on for, for, for drawing around nuclei, for example, we need to adjust the threshold. This is in the menu image adjust threshold. When you open it, you get a window like this that shows you a histogram of the data and it automatically defaults to the default a threshold adjuster and shows you what the image would look like with this black and white uh, view. For fluorescent images, dark background should be ticked because that's what your data look like. You can play around with different settings, either moving these manually, and then in which case you'd have to remember what the settings are, or you can use one of the other automated methods. And some of these work better with data that are uh, noisier than others. Um, so it's worth trying them out to see which works best for what, for what you want to do. There is an option called auto threshold, which will actually try all of these on data and show you the images so you can quickly choose the one that works best for you. This method is all global, global thresholding using the histogram from the entire image. There is a method for local thresholding that's available in Fiji called CLAHE, and that might work better if you have got uneven illumination across your sample. In most cases, our, our microscopes are set up to give you a flat field illumination, so this shouldn't be a problem. The output that you end up with is, oh, sorry, the output that you end up with is a, a binary image where the pixel values are either zero or two five five. So it's an eight bit image, and it only uses zero or the or maximum two five five. Making sure you tick the dark background is worth remembering. Um, you can set it using process binary options and actually tell it so that it always opens with uh, thresholding with black background. And if you do it without, it essentially swaps the data around and gives you the, the, the data the wrong, way, the wrong way around so that it finds the background as the, as the maximum and the, the blobs in this case of our nuclei as, as zero values. The threshold visualization in the preview is usually easier using optional lookup tables. So you can swap from black and white to uh, red. And so that will show you as red over red on black rather than white on black. Um, this can be quite nice to look at, uh, making it slightly easier. Although it doesn't work if your original image that you start with is, is, a, is on a red lookup table, this wouldn't help. But this is useful if you were starting with a grayscale image that was just look, using a grayscale uh, lookup table a gray, uh, with, with, with grays to white, so rather than using the black and white option. So to do the actual counting requires this binary image that we've created. The menu Analyze, Analyze Particles will bring up this window where it asks you how you want to uh, analyze the particles. We can limit the choices of what it finds using both size and circularity. Size is best determined empirically, so to do this you could use one of the drawing tools uh, to draw around the, the, the nuclei, for example, that you're trying to detect or the spots that you're trying to detect to ascertain what the expected minima and maximums are in size. 
This will show you in either in pixel squared or in micron squared, depending on whether your image is correctly scaled or not. Additionally, we can limit to it on circularity. And essentially this is giving us um, everything from uh, one is uh, the ratio of uh, sizes for, to give a perfect circle and zero would be something infinitely long. So this is going to show us everything. On top of that, we can ask it to give us a, an output that shows us what it looks like, for example, outlines or a mask. And at the bottom, we can cho choose how we limit the data. So excluding on edges won't give us any half cells that are on the edge of the field of view. Um, add to manager will add these regions of interest to a manager for us and summarize will give us an overview. So we can perform that, for example, on this blobs threshold that we just made. And this is the summary of the data here. It tells us how many it's found, what the total area it's found is, and the average size and the percentage area of the field that is, is counted. This drawing is the outline, so it shows you where each one is. And because we said add to manager, it opens the ROI manager for us and adds each region of interest in this big long list. This is useful because we can then, if we're interested in the intensity values of these, we can go back to the raw image, not this threshold one, and then press measure on the ROI manager to measure all of these for us. In terms of the circularity, in the thresholding, it's defined by four pi times the area of the perimeter squared. And here's examples of what the values look like, what, what the output looks like for different, different values. So everything above 0.5 sees almost everything. 0.7 starts to lose some of these elongated ones. Uh, greater than 0.8, you lose even more. And once you get up to the higher numbers, you're really only limited to the circular, very circular uh, regions of interest that are left behind. In reality, often our images aren't quite as uh, clear cut as that blobs example that I was showing you. And we end up with nuclei that look a bit more uh, speckly or diffuse and, and, and uneven, unevenly illuminated. And often some of them are close together and you need to separate them. So we can make some binary using the thresholding as we did before. And then we can either open or close them by eroding and dilating or dilating and eroding. All of these options are, are, are under the analyze uh, binary menu. So it's easy to do by opening the image, duplicating it, and selecting the, the nuclei channel to duplicate. Or if it's an RGB, we use menu image color split channels. Uh, making binary is as we've just done, image adjust and threshold. And then identifying the particles using analyze, analyze particles and setting the options to save the IRIs to a manager. Then we can return to this original image and extract the data using measure in the ROI manager. And we can get the intensity values and the areas from here rather than from these uh, um, thresholded images. I showed you the find, uh, the find maxima uh, option earlier for counting very small spots. You can also use it for counting nuclei. Um, for example, in this data here, you can, this is fairly typical that you've got different levels of condensation in the nuclear, in the nuclear DNA. And so the intensity of the, the, the dye that's intercalating into the DNA is different. And so you get these speckly cut shapes to the nucleus. You can also see that some of these are overlapping or right next to each other. Um, but what we can do is heavily blur this data. So try and smooth out of these nuclei and then using the find, find maxima we can try and find each individual nucleus. So again, we would open our raw image, duplicate the channel we're interested in, for example, using image duplicate, uh, and then blur it if necessary. So in this example, I've used a strong Gaussian blur with a sigma value of about five or six, I think, to try and smooth this data down. And then using the local maxima, I can adjust the parameters for the pro prominence to get it so that it finds pretty much all of the nuclei. There's some, for example, this one here is not found as, an, as a separate nucleus. And there's one here where it's counted two and it should only be one. But in general, it performs fairly well and has a, 
uh, advantage that it, it is at least reproducible and you can use it on using the same settings you can do this on multiple multiple images and so yes there'll be a certain percentage level of error you need to ascertain whether or not this is acceptable with the settings that you have and if it is acceptable then you can use this set as a quick method for count, counting um uh the, the, as long as you keep the settings the same between all of your images should should be reproducible Okay, so in terms of intensity measurements, as I said, we need to use the raw data files for the final measurements. So we can extract regions of interest or draw around our structures manually. We can do this on a reference channel, such as the DAPI or cell membrane marker channel. We can analyze multiple regions at once using the Analyze Tools ROI Manager uh, menu. It's actually easiest if you're going to be do drawing around structures manually to use the data in hyperstacks, and you can move. To, uh, you can have the channels overlaid uh, as a as a composite. And then, in terms of collecting the pixel data, if the reference channel is used for creating the ROI, you need to select the analysis channel first. Um, and in terms of fluorescence intensity, it is it is it is doable. You just have to make sure that the parameters that the images were required are the same. As I've said before, it's still only semi-quantitative and you have to use the raw data files, but it does allow you to make comparisons. And I've, as, as mentioned before, you could create a mask to, 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 to do the counting and come back to the data. Back to the raw data, sorry. So for example, here we can do manual drawing using the polygon region here. And just by simply holding the left mouse key down, you can draw around the nucleus. And then if I want to add them to the ROI manager, have the ROI manager open and press add or use the shortcut button as, as highlighted here. Um, this allows us to then measure all of them at once and or use some of the other options so that we can measure all of the channels as well. In terms of what's reported, we can change this in the menu, analyze set measurements, and this allows control. You can export absolutely everything if you like, but many of these we probably wouldn't need. So the area, for example, will be reported in the pixel scale in the image. So as the images are scaled, it'd be in micron squared, otherwise it's pixel squared. You need to make sure by reading the top of the info bar for the, for the image as to which it is. We can report the mean, the mode, and the median for the gray values as well as the standard deviation within the region of interest that you've drawn. We can take the minimum and maximum gray values for the data, so if, it's, if there's any thresholding applied. You can get the center of mass, so this is essentially the XY coordinates, and or the bounding rectangle and the shape descriptors to tell you what, what, how, how elongated or round the shape is. The ferrets diameter and the fitted ellipse are similar. Uh, all of these can be looked up uh, on the, in the help menu here to get find out the details of each one. Integrated density will give you two values. It gives you the raw int den, which is the sum of all of the pixels within the region of interest. And then if the image is scaled, it'll give you the that, that integrated density per micron squared, for example. So essentially similar to a mean value, but instead of being a mean per pixel, it will be a mean per micron squared. Uh, and that's and it calls that int den rather than raw int den. It's important that you know, know the difference because one's normalized by area and one isn't. We can look at the normality of the data based on the skewness and the area fraction. You can tell it to report the stack position if you've only analyzed a certain uh, part of the Z stack. And uh, kurtosis is also showing you uh, normality of the data. And uh, perimeter will also give you the, the full distance around the region of interest. So you can use it for determining how, how uh, the, the edge, length of the edge. There is an option to redirect all of the analysis to another open image. So you can draw the regions of interest in one image and oh, tell it to use another. I don't tend to use this because you have to then reset this with analyze set measurements every time you start a new image. Um, I tend to leave this alone and uh, just use hyperstacks and we work on it that way. Display label is very useful because it allows you to keep an audit trail of where you took the data from. 
So it'll give you uh, within each uh, result for, for each line of the results, it'll tell you which image and which channel the data were analyzed on. So it's really, really worth switching on, I think. And decimal places, uh, anything out bigger than about three is usually not necessary. So in terms of intensity measurements, here's an example where we have, have the results from the three things that I drew. It gives us a label. I've taken the area, the mean, and as I said before, we have the integrated density, which will be per micron squared because of the scaling of this image, uh, or the sum of all of the pixels in each of the ROIs. And then I've got the min and max thresholds for this data. And you can see I haven't got any thresholding set. This is the min and max of a 16-bit image. So ROI Manager is available in, in the menu Analyze Tools ROI Manager. At the bottom there is a, a more and you can choose help and it will give you further details. The measure button will measure selected ROI if one or, one or two is selected or, or multiple. If all are selected or none are selected, it will measure all. There's an option under more down here there, where you can choose multi-measure, and this can be used to measure all of the channels and slices in the image at once using the selected ROIs or all of the ROIs. If you ensure that the regions of interest are drawn on the first channel in the hyperstack, then the measurement data will be of whichever channel is currently selected in the image. So you can use the channels tool to move across to another image and, and then you'll get the measurements from those. You need to ensure that set measurements label is on to provide this output in the results so that you can tell, tell which channel it is that you've had. So here, for example, these ROIs were drawn in channel one, and then this is the coordinates of the, of the centroid for the ROI. And here I've analyzed channel two of three by sliding the data to the channels to number two, so that I'm, I'm select, I have channel two selected before I press measure. There's another option for um, rather than looking at areas, we can look at um, line profiles as well. And we can do this with the line tool, which is this, looks like a straight line here. If you double click on it, you can set the width of the line. By increasing the width, it will uh, average across, the, across that line width as it's giving you the line profile. This can be useful for smoothing data um, when, you, when you're trying to look at when you're trying to look at something where it's quite grainy or noisy. Um, if I right click on this, uh, it'll give us an option for whether or not you want a straight line, a segmented line, a freehand line, or an arrow tool. So an arrow tool is not used, used for, for uh, analysis, so it would literally just be for drawing an arrow. But a, a straight line or segmented line lets you draw around, around complex shapes and get the length of those complex shapes or the perimeter of those complex shapes, for example, but it, and it doesn't have to come to an end. The two ends don't have to join, uh, which they would in a, in a polygon, for example. After you've drawn your line and chosen the thickness, you can click Analyze and choose Plot Profile, and this will draw the profile of the current, of the current line that's drawn. So here, this line is drawn from left to right, and this is the plot profile with the gray values of this 8-bit image. Uh, going from zero to two five five as it goes across this uh, across this membrane marker. It has an option for a live at the bottom, and if you select this, you can move to another channel in the image, and it will give you the intensity plot profile for that. There are a lot more options in terms of how we, how you uh, show the data on here, and you can use this to produce graphs with legends, etc. Your other option is to just extract the data from here using a list uh, command, and this will give you the actual values for the distance and the gray values across this line. And you can see I've drawn quite a thick line, so this is averaged across the line as it goes along. <coughs> there are a lot more options that we can use in Fiji. Line lengths and intensity profiles on curved, segmented, or straight lines, as I've just uh, demonstrated. 
There is an angle tool for measuring angles. We can measure sphericity. We can measure the location within the image. It entirely depends on what you're trying to get out of your data. There are also a lot of other plugins available to aid analysis that I haven't had time to look to go into for you. And of course, it depends on what the sort of analysis you're doing as to which you need. So co-localization, for example, there are plenty of tools for doing this. And for, for looking at the registration between two different channels and how much of the overlap um, so that you can ascertain whether or not there is much of a difference between two different treatments, for example. There are plenty of plugins from looking at time series, including tracking so that you can follow things over time. If you've got, for instance, lifetime data or, for instance, resonance and energy transfer data, so you can look at FRET, there are tools for doing these, simple, these sort of simple ratios. And there are trainable segmentation plugins, such as uh, Weka, that allow you to teach it how, how it should work. Um, this is reasonably good, although I think I, my preference when it comes to using machine learning is, is to use a different uh, uh, a different tool called Elastic, um, which would require a, a different uh, tutorial to teach you how to use Elastic. Lastly, it is easy to record your own macros to automate tasks using the uh, plugins macros record tool. Uh, you can record the simple image manipulations as you do it, and it will add each command to the recorder for you. Once you're happy with your with your basic set of commands, you can then cre click create and it will create the macro. That macro will then run the same on every image that you choose. So if you're doing simple things such as uh, converting an image to a composite or flattening a Z stack or adjusting brightness and contrast to set values for each channel, this is, this is a way of doing it. You can also cre create more complicated ones for, for example, the thresholding and the counting. As, as I've shown. In terms of online resources, a bioimaging unit does have a, a YouTube website and we do have a, a, an intro to Fiji, which is short, shows you a bit more hands-on by one of my colleagues. And she's done a nice job of that, it's worth looking at. Um, the Royal Microscopical Society, RMS, they've got a lovely website with links to many online resources. And if you scroll down to recorded talks and lectures, uh, there are some nice links. And this, the, these ones in particular I like. Uh, this one from Janelia in the US is good. And the Focal Plane website has a nice good list of Fiji resources on it as well. One of which, uh, this one, I particularly like. It's, it's, it's a really, really bit more in-depth uh, presentation than I've done today uh, and, and could be useful. And of course, don't forget that there is uh, pl plenty of other options out there in terms of the forums and people are friendly and will, will help if needs be. Um, you have my email address at the start of this presentation. So if needed, you can uh, contact us at, uh, the, at the bioimaging unit. And if, if we've got time, we'll be able to give you help as well. I hope that's been of use. And uh, yeah, just contact us if you need any help. <laughs>